World Bank warns more than 30 million Nigerians may live in extreme poverty by 2030. Emirates Airlines faces seizure of its aircraft in Nigeria to satisfy court judgment. On the international scene, NATO leaders kick off summit in London as US President Trump lashes out at French President Macron. Athletics Federation of Nigeria board member Solomon Ogba resigns. This is ANN News. I am Olajimoke Olatunji. The World Bank has issued an ominous warning to the Nigerian government. More than 30 million Nigerians may live in extreme poverty in the next 10 years. In its 2019 economic update report, the bank also says the country will be home to a quarter of the world's destitute people if the government fails to revive economic growth and create jobs. The report was released on Monday. The World Bank has urged President Muhammad Buhari to increase domestic revenue. It also asked the president to remove trade restrictions and expensive fuel subsidies. The bank warns that failure to take action would see more Nigerians falling into extreme poverty. It also stressed that Nigeria could slide back into recession if crude prices fell by 25% to $50 a barrel. The report paints a gloomy picture of the country's economy. It says the Nigerian population is growing at a fast pace than the economy. It also says an estimated 100 million Nigerians today live on just above 800 naira per day. Doctors in Lagos under the umbrella of the Medical Guild have rejected the state government's minimum wage. The group says it is below the expectations of civil servants. Chairman of the Guild, Dr. Babajide Sahid, expressed the decision while briefing the press on the scientific conference that begins in Lagos today. The Medical Guild is the association of medical doctors employed by Lagos State. Sahid said not only is the new minimum wage unacceptable, the Guild was not involved in the negotiations. The Guild is also asking Governor Babajide Sonwolu for tax exemption on coal duty paid to doctors, as was done during Ashwaju Bola Tinumbu's administration. The Guild also wants the doctor's retirement age reviewed to 65 years, just as has been done for teachers. The Gaste kick started payments of 35,000 naira per month minimum wage for its workers in November. The national minimum wage is 30,000 naira per month. Emirates Airlines is facing the seizure of its Boeing 777 aircraft in Nigeria if it does not satisfy a Lagos Federal High Court judgment of 8 million naira against it. One Dr. Charles Makunye had sought the order of court to enforce a Supreme Court judgment against the airline in a suit between Promise Makunye and Emirates Airlines. Promise Makunye, who was a student in the U.S., brought the lawsuit against the airlines in 2008 for refusing to honor her round-trip airline ticket from Texas to Nigeria. She said the airline refused to refuse or rather refund her payment for the ticket and gave no explanation for failing to do so. A federal high court had ruled against the airline for breach of contract in 2010 and awarded damages and legal costs of a quarter million naira. Emirates appealed and won. The plaintiff took the case to the Supreme Court where it was overturned in February this year. The judgment debt plus interest has now accumulated to about 8 million naira and Emirates has not complied with the judgment. It now faces seizure of one of the aircraft she did fly into Nigeria. And meanwhile, the same Federal High Court in Lagos has ordered the forfeiture of two houses belonging to former Senate President Bukola Saraki in a case filed by the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, ESCC. But Saraki disputes the order, saying the forfeiture order is an abuse of court process and violation of a subsisting order of the Federal High Court in Abuja. Saraki's special advisor on media and publicity, Yusuf Olayni Yonu, has released a statement alleging that the claim was false, that the properties were abused with the proceeds of fraud. Olayni Yonu said the Abuja court had issued a restraining order preventing the forfeiture of the properties by EFCC and anyone else. He said Saraki began construction of the properties during the last few weeks of his tenure as governor of Kwara State and that he paid for the work with checks. He accused the EFCC of playing politics and spreading falsehood. 
He described the EFCC action as a cheap attempt to witch hunt and intimidate a perceived enemy. A petrol tanker has crashed into a drainage tunnel in Onicha. A number of states on Monday has a drive to avoid crushing a female National Youth Service Corps member who was dashing across the highway. A number of sector commander of the Federal Road Safety Corps, FRSC, Andrew Kumakbayi, said three persons were involved. He said none was killed, but one person was injured. Kumapai said the petrol tanker lost control as it tried to avoid hitting the female NYSC member who was trying to cross the highway. He said the lady corpa sustained injuries when she saw the movements of the vehicle and jumped into the gutter. She said to be receiving treatment at a hospital. There was no report on the condition of the tanker driver whose vehicle was said to have carried no product when the accident happened. This has not been the first time the House of Representatives would adjourn to mourn a deceased member. It is actually a tradition. So the House of Reps is adjourned today as a result of the death of Monday, a Monday of Jafaru Eliasu from Niger State. House Speaker Femi Gajabiamila announced on Monday that today's planned celebration of the International Day of Persons with Disabilities is now postponed. Plenary is also adjourned and how this would affect the week's planned passage of the 2020 budget is not yet known. Coming up, African stories. Heavy rains and floods continue to batter East Africa, leaving death and destruction in their wake. And later, international news. NATO leaders kick off summit in London as US President Trump lashes out as its French counterpart. Welcome back. This is Anna News. And now to African stories. Heavy rains have continued to batter East Africa, bringing death and destruction, and rivers have burst their banks, bridges, and roads destroyed. Entire Kenyan villages have been swept away in floods and landslides that have killed at least three persons in the east of the country over the past two days. United Nations says at least three million persons are affected across the eastern horn of Africa, and thousands have been displaced. Also, seven persons in Tanzania have been killed by floods. Experts warn torrential rains will continue for another week. Cameroon's separatist rebels are anteing up their resistance to the government as they fired on a Cameroon Airlines passenger jet as approached Bermenda Airline Airport in the northwest of the country on Sunday. Cameroon Airlines said in a statement the captain was able to land the plane smoothly despite the impact of its fuselage. It says there was no casualty. Cameroon's English-speaking West has been fighting against the government since 2017, seeking to form a breakaway state called Ambazonia. Civilians have paid heavy price for the start and more than 400 persons have been killed and half a million have been forced to flee their homes. But Sunday's incident is seen as an escalation of hostilities. It also signals more danger in air travel to and from the English-speaking regions where the rebels are active. And one of the separatists said Cameroon Airlines and its passengers have been warned that the rebels would shoot at the planes if no flight shutters were provided ahead of time. It claimed the government uses the aircraft to transport troops and ammunition. The protests began as peaceful demonstrations in the southwest calling for greater representation for English-speaking citizens in the largely French-speaking country. The demonstrations have now degenerated into violence that dogs the region almost every day. Uganda is working hard to improve its tourism industry, and the country hopes it can attract many more millions to visit the country. It is not leaving out marine tourism as it seeks more investment in the sector. Hilary Ayesige reports. Speeding up visitors' numbers, Peter Mives is making money from luxury boating. There's a lot to see on the lake. We have the Mabamba um, that has the shoebill stock bird that's a very rare species all over the world. It's, it's almost only around this region, so there's a lot to see. We have also the fishing escapades. If you want to go out fishing uh, to catch mainly the Nile Pash, which grows up to 200 kilos. The boat is equipped with a music system and life-saving jackets. 
A ride on this boat for two hours costs about 150 US dollars. Peter has seven boats on the lake and he now plans to add more four so that he can improve on the safety of water transport on Lake Victoria. Several other people have now ventured into marine tourism. Holidaymakers and hotel owners are upbeat about the move. The safer vessels mean a lot to us because it means more business for us. It means our clients are safe and they can still come back over and over again. It's such a beautiful place and uh, I think to have more fast, safe vessels to get you get quick and safe to your destination, I think it would be a big plus for, for the tourism industry here. But there are still concerns about the safety of water transport in Uganda. Figures from Uganda police show that over 50 people have died in boat accidents since last year. Most of the boats are not seaworthy. So I realized um, we didn't really have that much decent transport on the water, you know. I mean, everyone you would ask about, you know, going out on the water or having a ride on the water would think about the conventional or um, um, local traditional wooden boats and they would be very uncomfortable getting on these boats. They wouldn't feel safe at all. The Uganda government has now come up with strict guidelines for vessels crossing Uganda's waters. And as the country attracts more investment in marine tourism, it's hoped that visitors could make Uganda their preferred destination. Linguistic history is being made after students at the, at the University of Cape Town graduated from a course in a 200,000 year old indigenous language. The Khoisan are known to be one of the earliest inhabitants of southern Africa, but their language was mostly lost during the ages, with colonialism said to be a major cause. Reporter Trevor Andrews has more. With one third of the world's 6,000 languages all spoken in Africa, the continent's linguistic roots are certainly deep. But Khoi Khoi Kavab is a language so rare that there are only said to be 167,000 speakers left. Today though, there's reason to celebrate, as these lot are the new crop that will play an important role in preventing the total loss of the language. They graduated from the University of Cape Town's first Khoi Khoi Kavab language course, a move which the institution hopes will be an historical intervention. History in the making, this is the first time of its kind at any university that this is taking place. We urge other universities and other institutes to see the important significance of doing the promotion the, the, the preservation and the development of Koiko Gova, of Koiko language. This is such an important thing because we have lost so much things and here's, here we have an opportunity to, within our lifetimes, to actually restore something that's so, 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 so invaluable. This is not only something that we're doing for present uh, people, it's also for future. Most of its speakers are centered in the greater Namakwiland area, but here in the Western Cape there remains not only a community that cherishes their rich history, language and culture, but new speakers wanting to learn more. I found out about it, my mom found out about it, we came straight away and the course itself was an amazing journey to go on to learn this language that was used by my ancestors, by everyone's ancestors. Um, definitely made a change in my life and it makes a change in everyone's life just even to know a few words out of it. The course is being offered by the University Centre for Extramural Activities and comes after the traditional and Khoisan leadership bill was just signed into law by President Cyril Ramaphosa. Kwai Kwai Gavab may be one of Africa's most endangered indigenous languages but this university has even bolder plans than its introductory course. It also aims to make it the fourth language at the institution, after Isikosa, English and Afrikaans, which will assist efforts in promoting indigenous Khoisan languages and multilingualism at the institution. We need our uh, official language status. In fact, we also need each of the various languages, like the Kung, the, the Nama, the Koko Govap, um, the Ngu, uh, the Khoi Dam, um, and all the, the, the languages belong to the Khoi and the, the San people, the Bushmen, each one needs their own language board, so it can be more specialized development because now broadly all they are all clustered into one language uh, body. So now though the ceremony caps off years of activism work done by the Khoisan community and academics to further enrich the pool of knowledge that can make this linguistic treasure something that is never lost to the ages.
when we return international news. NATO leaders kick off summit in London as US President Trump lashes out at his French counterpart. And later, sports. AFN board member Solomon Ogwe resigned. Welcome back. This is AN News. Now to international stories. NATO leaders, including U.S. President Donald Trump, are gathered in London to mark the alliance's 70th anniversary. As is customary for him, President Trump had to chew on somebody, so he slammed French leader Emmanuel Macron ahead of their meeting on Tuesday, saying Macron's earlier comments on NATO's brain death was very nasty. Macron had said a few months ago that Trump's action had caused NATO's brain death. Fellow NATO leaders attending the summit in London will be relieved that Trump who derailed last year's agenda, but his demands appears to be satisfied with how the Allies have stepped up their military investment. But UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson will still be nervous that Trump's presence will hurt him in the closing stages of the British election campaign. The North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO, was founded after World War II to counter the threat of Soviet expansion. The 29 member states pledged to come to each other's aid if any of them were attacked. Macron complained last month that NATO members were no longer cooperating on key issues. France and the European Union say they are ready to retaliate if U.S. President Donald Trump acts on the threat to impose duties of up to 100% on $2.5 billion in imports of champagne, handbags and other French products. The threat of punitive tariffs came after a U.S. government investigation found France's new digital services tax would harm U.S. technological companies and will intensify a festering trade disputes between Europe and the United States. Speaking in London on Tuesday morning ahead of the NATO alliance summit, Trump said he would not allow France to take advantage of American companies and that the European Union treated the United States very unfairly on trade. French Finance Minister Bruno Le Maire says the U.S. threat is unacceptable. He also disagreed that the French tax discriminates against American companies. A U.S. House Intelligence Committee report that lays out the Democratic case for President Donald Trump's impeachment is being publicly released today. The democratically controlled panel is expected to vote on the report's approval on Tuesday night. A copy of the report was made available privately to House Intelligence members on Monday night for a 24-hour review. Republican Representative Jim Jordan, an ardent defender of Trump, told reporters he had read portions of the report in a secure room at the Capitol, but was instructed not to discuss the contents until Tuesday night. House Republicans issued their own rebuttal report on Monday, saying Democrats had not established an impeachable offense by Trump. On Monday, congressional Democrats named the four witnesses who will testify this week at a public hearing in the impeachment inquiry. And what is seen as a likely precursor to the announcement of formal charges within weeks. The United Nations Climate Change Conference, known as COP25, opened in Madrid on Monday after it was moved from Santiago. Uh, the 10-day summit begins today and brings together more than 25,000 delegates from 200 countries. It will strive to reach agreements to tackle the effects of global warming and keep it within manageable limits. World leaders are gathering in the Spanish capital, Madrid, for the International Climate Conference. They're supposed to be stepping up efforts to stop global warming. The summit aims to put the finishing touches to the rules governing the 2015 Paris Accord. The two-week summit will see world leaders presenting how exactly they plan to avert the most catastrophic impacts of global warming. United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres called on world leaders to take concrete action, warning that the world now faces a climate crisis. Still to come, sports. AFN board member Solomon Ogba resigns. Welcome back. This is AN News in Sports. A board member of the Athletics Federation of Nigeria, Solomon Ogba, has resigned from the board. Ogba also presides over Delta State Athletics Association. He says he was not comfortable with what he calls dirty politicking that has taken over the Athletics Federation. 
Ogba also says he was not happy with the AFN constitution and rules have been relegated to the background. The opening group games of 2021 Africa Cup of Nations qualification has delivered two casualties already. One week after the completion of the first two group matches, Eswatini and the Sudan are now looking for new coaches. Eswatini have not revealed, renewed their coach, Costa Pakic's contract, while the Sudan have also told Zutrake Logarushi he will not get an extension of his deal either. Lugarusik has been in charge of Sudan for the past two years. The faith of Serbian born Papik was uh, sealed after it was seen as three new laws to Guinea Bissau and four went at home to Senegal last month. Papic has sent more, spent more than a decade working in South Africa before it was seen.